Thank you. Thanks, Faith. So my name is Natasha. I am a Commonwealth Scholar from 2019, and I was at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where I did a master's in epidemiology. So today we're going to be talking about scholarships, master's scholarships, which is how to search for scholarships, what scholarships are available by region, general application tips and common mistakes that people make. So Faith, a lot of people are usually very curious and some people don't even know where to start. So my first question to you is how do I start applying for a scholarship for a master's? So this is actually a million dollar question because um, a lot of people, including myself, when I started applying for scholarships, I started very ignorant about a lot of things. Um, I had been applying for scholarships for about three years before I finally landed the MasterCard Foundation Scholarship. And in that process, one thing I wish I knew was I should have started to find scholarships based on the region. So the first step I would say, where do you start from? Categorize the scholarship search by region. So first think about which country or which continent would you want to start your program? Is it on the African continent? Is it um, by country? Maybe you say you want to study in the UK or you say, no, me, I just want to study in, in, in the Netherlands or I just want to study in Australia. So separate your, before you do anything, think about which country or which region geographically you would want to um, receive a scholarship. And this is going to help you work towards understanding what you need to put together for you to be able to be eligible for those kind of scholarships. And in this presentation, we'll be able to highlight some of the most common scholarships by each of these regions. So I'll start with the United Kingdom because obviously I'm more biased to it because I just finished my program from the University of Edinburgh. Um, there are so many scholarships that are available for students, um, aspiring students, especially Zambian citizens in the United Kingdom. And these are just a list of a couple of the ones that um, I know um, and that Natasha and I know. So we have the Commonwealth Scholarship. Natasha, are you able to share a bit about this one? I think this is the one that you were on. Yeah, thanks, Faith. Well, the Commonwealth Scholarship has many different different kinds of scholarships. So we have the master's scholarship. This one works usually by nominating bodies. So you have to look out for the nominating bodies for your country. For example, the UK has got the scholarships for all Commonwealth countries, but for example, Zambia has different nominating bodies. There's the Higher Education Scholarships Board, which does the nominations. And I think the nominations passed a few weeks ago, but the other partners which also nominate this Faweza, there is Harley, there is Canon Collins. So you have to look for which is the nominating body for your country. That's for the Commonwealth Masters. For the Commonwealth Shared Scholarship, what happens is that this one, it's usually on your school's website because what happens is it's called shared because the school pays part of your fees while the Commonwealth pays the other part. So you go to the schools. This is only for UK-based UK-based universities. <laughs> I said organizations. Yeah, UK-based universities, and that's where you would get it. Then there's also the PhD, which is for people that have just completed their masters. Yeah, Faith. I hope that was comprehensive enough. Yeah, that that was. Thanks, Natasha. Um, I just wanted to mention, as a housekeeping, please, if you are not able to hear us, just type in the chat box in case we lose connection or anything like that. So yeah, just to continue, we also have um, scholarships in the United Kingdom. There's also the Chevening Scholarship. Um, I'm sure a couple of you have heard about this scholarship. Um, this one, together with the MasterCard Foundation Scholarship, they are very much um, interested in candidates who have some kind of community-led change or interests in that field. If you've maybe led change in your community or you've been part of an association or some, showed some kind of leadership skills, this, then these two scholarships are the ones I would really encourage you to be targeting. We also have the Bait Scholarship, uh, the Bait Trust Scholarship, um, as well as the Rhodes Scholarship. Rhodes Scholarship is a prestigious, you know, prestigious scholarship. And this one is, allows you to study at the Oxford University. Um, it's quite a prestigious scholarship as well. Um, then we have direct scholarships from the schools or the universities. Um, these, this, these are instances where 
after you've already figured out the program you want to study, you've applied to the school, you are then allowed to take advantage of the scholarships provided at the universities. Um, some of the universities which provide scholar direct university or faculty-based scholarships are universities like University College London, Oxford University, London School of, Tropi London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, University of Edinburgh as well, uh, Bradford and Nottingham and Nottingham Trent. So these provide scholarships based on the faculty. And you would find that they are beneficial only after you have applied for the program and have been selected. And then they'll tell you, oh, for you to be able to be eligible for 50% discount or 75% discount, these are the scholarships you can apply to. So Natasha, can you maybe tell us a bit about broadly the scholarships available in Europe? So if somebody on this call might be interested in, okay, I like the UK, but I think I'm thinking more generally, what scholarships can I think about when I'm looking at other countries in Europe? Thanks, Faith. I was trying to unmute myself. You would think that we have gotten a hang of this after all these Zoom calls. Well, okay. For Europe, we have the Swedish government scholarships. We have the Irish scholarship. We have the Erasmus Mundi. We have OKP, which is the Orange Knowledge Program. OKP is very wide scholarship. I'm very biased towards health-related courses, but we'll be talking a lot more about those. But generally, OKP has got scholarships for the Netherlands. And usually, you check with the university first, and then the university will show under their fees and funding portal which scholarships are available. And when you find OKP, you know that it's a great scholarship and you can apply for it. There's also DAAD, which is a German scholarship. And the scholarships board in Zambia does give scholarships to Russia as well. Yeah. Great, so we also have scholarships in Africa. I've met people who've asked me, okay, I know that there are scholarships outside the continent, but what about if I want to stay within the continent for maybe time zone re reasons, you want to stay within the region. So the number of scholarships that you can um, consider, there's the MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program. So the MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program has um, accredited certain universities for students to be able to receive scholarships from there. So just to mention a few, there's Aseshi, um, there's University of Cape Town in South Africa, there's Africa Leadership University in Mauritius, University of Pretoria, and many others. There are also other um, universities in South Africa um, that have scholarships available for Zambians. For example, the Mandela Road Scholarship, as well as the Canyon Collins Scholarship. So these are purely South African-based scholarships, South African-based universities. So scholarships are available for Zambians at these um, universities. And then just like I mentioned for the United Kingdom, there are also scholarships that are university-based and these are at universities in South Africa, like University of Cape Town, University of Pretoria, and, and so many others. And the Bait Trust um, Scholarship as well does provide um, opportunities for some to apply for scholarships to universities on the continent. So these are some of the scholarships that uh, would be available for you to consider. Thanks, so, Faith. You know, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, so we've spoken about, if you're looking at the world map, picturing the world map, we've spoken about United Kingdom, we've spoken about broadly Europe, then we've come down to Africa. So now we'll go west, depending on the side of the map that you're looking at or the, the compass and go to um, the Americas. Yes, just before we get there, Faith, I just wanted to mention that South African schools have a lot of scholarships, even those we haven't put here. But you find that usually they have a very short window and they need you to have an acceptance. I see some random women scholarships and things like that. So if you're thinking of South Africa, I usually recommend that you apply to the schools and get an acceptance first, and then you keep your eye out for the different kinds of scholarships that might come up because the schools usually write you an email to tell you which scholarships are open. And they are usually only write emails to people who have been already accepted at these schools. Yeah. 
coming to the Asian and African, I mean, Asian and Australian region, we have government scholarships. So most of the scholarships in Asia are government. There's the Korean government, there is the Chinese government, and you can usually find this on a website called Campus China, which is the Chinese government. But in Zambia, the Higher Education Learning and Scholarships Board, please correct me if I'm wrong, I didn't double check this, but um, the, the, the Scholarships Board, or we call it BC in Zambia, um, the BC, I will just use that just to save myself because I didn't double check this. Well, BC does provide scholarships for Chinese and even Russian. But in Australia and New Zealand, there's the Adelaide Scholarship. And this one is usually for institutions that are in Australia or New Zealand. And often it starts at master's level, which is going to go all the way into PhD. So most of the times it starts with an MPhil, which ends in a PhD. Then there's Australia Awards Africa and um, the other last university in Australia as well. In America, a lot of people think America has no master's scholarships. That is because no one advertises master's scholarships. Most of them are school-based or university-based. The Ivy League universities like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, I'm also biased towards health, so I'm thinking Johns Hopkins, those schools have scholarships. For example, at Johns Hopkins, half the class is already funded, but they don't advertise that. You have to apply and get into the school, then you will be um, eligible for some of those scholarships. So for America, I always recommend that you just apply to the school directly and you get in. And most of the times people were not applying to America because of the GMAT and GRE requirements. But I'm happy to say that this year, because of COVID and even next year, they are trying to scrape off the GMAT and GRE requirement for most of the programs. So if you are not thinking of applying, it's a good time to apply. There is the Fulbright scholarship that is given by the US embassy or that is facilitated by the US embassy for some American universities and it's for both masters and PhD. Otherwise, most of them are based at the school. The other global scholarships as well that you can think of like Queen Elizabeth Commonwealth Scholarship. This one is for several countries in, in the region. They are not just for Commonwealth, un, Commonwealth University based countries, but they're even for other countries, but by Commonwealth um, citizens, I would say, yeah. Now Faith, most of the times when people hear about all these different scholarships, it sounds a bit overwhelming, don't you think? How would you yeah. select the program? So I was actually even going to say, it sounds a bit overwhelming to hear all these regions and all these scholarships, but I think in terms of what can help you in choosing which one to go for and which one to start to apply to, you need to apply four steps. Um, these are firstly, think about the field you want to study rather than the program. So in this case, think about, okay, I want to study something in education or I want to study something in law. I want to study something in STEM. I think that broad perspective is going to help you in finding the best scholarship that is suited for the needs, um, your needs. Secondly, look at the requirements. So assess the query requirements for the scholarship as well as for the university. And I'll give you a very practical example. This is something that happened to me. So I had been applying for scholarships for about three years or so, just after I finished undergrad at CBU in 2017. And the big mistake I made, or rather what I wasn't aware of is that when you're applying for the scholarship, you also have to think about the kind of work experience that you have. And at the time, um, over the, this past three, the, over the three years I was applying, one thing I was not considering is that the work experience I had versus the scholarships I was applying for were not matching. So I was doing a lot of international development work. So I was working for Restless at the same time, Natasha and I had already started Copper Rose by then. And I was thinking, I should have been thinking, you know, international development, but instead, because I had a business degree, I had a business administration degree from CBU, I was applying for finance, um, a master's program. So I was applying for an MBA or, or, or master's in finance and investment and things like that. So it was very difficult when, I, when it came to answering the essay questions for me to justify why should they award this scholarship to me? Why should they admit me to this university? Because the experience I have, 
very much international development. So one, how I turned this around and which in, in, in the end benefited me and was able to, I was able to get the master that scholarship was tying my experience and finding a program that helps me you know, in my career trajectory. And that's how I was able to land on the Africa and International Development Program I studied at the University of Edinburgh. So this is very important. Think about the requirements, read about the requirements and also the university's requirements as well. Because, you know, comparing the two and comparing what you have is what is going to help you to be able to make the best decision in terms of selecting the scholarship and the program. And thirdly, when you're reading the requirements for the scholarship, Please guys, read the requirements about the target um, population of the scholarship. So certain scholarships will be specific and say, we want under thirties or we want young women, or we want people who have experience in this and this and this. So please be careful when you read those instructions because that is what is going to make you know, help you get the, the, the response you want or not. And I've seen people who would spend all their energies applying for a scholarship that is in tech, but they only studied like one course in technology in their master's in their undergraduate degree at university of at university of zambia so please think through and read the target population of the scholarship and finally once you have an idea of the program read the course content read what does the university um, offer on this program and see if you'll be a great fit just another example when i was applying for the mastercard foundation scholarship i came across two programs which were very close to what I wanted. There was one about design for change and the African international development course I ended up doing. So I really wanted the design for change one. Even when I read the course content, I was like, wow, this is great. I'm going to be designing for change. But I later on realized that it, it is designed for change, but you need an architectural background. And Lord knows I have zero architectural experience. Even my drawing is terrible. <laughs> so really take time to read the course content and see if you're a great fit. Um, and that way you'll be able to make the best selection for your scholarship and the program to, to end up taking. Thanks, Faith, that's really important. However, I have a, another thought on the target. Sometimes the target is not supposed to make you decide that you don't you shouldn't do this course. For example, when you look at Shivening, it says it's one wants leaders. And you think, I don't really have any leadership experience. I always tell people that we are leaders. Some people lead from the middle, some people lead from the front, but we all have leadership capabilities. So when you think about the target, sometimes you want to think of how can you make yourself look like the target that they want. So if you want to apply for a leadership-based program, how can you show your leadership skills in whatever form? For example, were you taking any leadership roles in university? Are you volunteering anywhere? Because volunteering is also a leadership trait. So it's about tailoring your questions, well, the answer to your questions, the scholarship questions in a way that makes you look like the target. Yeah, that's what I would say. Great, thanks, Natasha. Okay, so now you have the program, you've selected the course you want to do and you've started to narrow down um, or at least have an idea of the region where you want to be based. What next? That's the next million dollar question. So Natasha, take us through what to do after this. Well, what next is that usually you want to create a map and the map will help you track the guidelines, courses, and requirements. So for those that are joining us and everyone that has questions, before I go on, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and we'll be able to respond and answer them. But coming back to this question, you need to create a map. I remember the time I was applying in my room, I had one side of the wall, which had some flip charts, and had put everything that was there. So a map is something that helps you track deadlines. You need to track deadlines because most people, when we get to the common mistakes, we'll see that most people miss deadlines. And the thing with this is that once you miss the deadline, you won't be allowed back in. The portal closes completely. So you need to look at the courses that you've chosen and look at the schools and just get an idea of the deadline. If you choose a school or you choose a scholarship, you need to understand how much work will be required. So for example, you need to look through 
how much work will be required because that will help you understand. If you set aside two days for something that needs five days, then that's a problem. But it doesn't have to be on your wall. It can also be in a notebook where you've put down all the courses, all the deadlines, all the requirements and anything that you will need to do to get there. Second, you need to reach out to people who've received the scholarships you're targeting. I know this is a bit challenging, but I want to say, when you reach out to someone who has received a scholarship, don't reach out to them to ask for help. It's unfair for you to call or text someone, say, hi, I'm applying for this scholarship. Can I have your help? I think it's very difficult. And sometimes people might seem like they're not helpful because of the way you ask. When you call someone who's received a scholarship, ask for information, make your request very clear to say, hi, I'm applying for this scholarship. I want to you to help me with how to choose the course. So that way people will be more likely to help you and they will be more helpful if your ask is targeted. You can either ask them what courses that you can choose, what course best suits you. You can ask them to proofread your essays, but you need to make your ask very clear and don't just text or call someone saying I'm asking for help because then it sounds like you want them to write the application for you and that's not fair and they will usually seem unresponsive that way. Another thing you need to do is you need to get your paperwork together. Getting your paperwork together is very important and some of the things you might have to think about are things like transcripts. Do you have the official transcript for your program? Sometimes that might mean you need to travel, you need to send the right emails, but you need a detailed transcript for your program, which is certified or stamped by your school. You might also need to get together other things that may be required. For example, in the UK and the US, you need to write exams, which is the English examinations. So you need to get started with those. And Faith will talk a little bit later about what kind of investments you need to make, but writing exams is one investment you can make. The last one is, can you hear me? I'm getting a sign that my internet is unstable. Faith, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can everyone hear? Okay, great. So, yes, go ahead. All right, great. So getting your paperwork together is getting all the documentation that is required and ensuring that you have it on hand so that when they request for it, you have it or when you need to, to upload it onto the portal or submit it, you will have it. The last one is finding references. It's very important for you to find the right references and you need to prepare the references about your plans because sometimes you just put a random person who doesn't even know what's happening so when the school sends them an email to be your reference, they will be like, who's this or what are they doing? So you need to pick the right references. Just because someone knows your lecturer doesn't make them a good reference. You need to pick the right references and prepare the references and inform them about your plans. Faith, I, I know you had quite an experience with references. Do you want to share more about this? Oh, yes. Um, so this finding of references is very important. I remember when, when I started my application process, I had a hard time reaching certain lecturers who I had kind of developed a relationship with, maybe because they were my supervisor or because I took a course in two years consecutively. And I would write them emails, maybe they won't respond or they'll respond after the deadline. So I just said, you know what, let me just travel to the copper belt. I'm based in Osaka. So I said, let me travel to the copper belt, go and meet these lecturers in person and just explain and say, sir, or oh, madam, I'm applying for 25 scholarships or 25, um, um, I need 25 reference letters. So that way we have an understanding of the kind of task that is ahead of them and how can, we, how can I help them help me? And this was, to be honest, the best thing that I ever did because after that, the responses were quick. I would get a 24 to 48 hour response on the reference letters. And we can kind of came up with a system to say, I will draft the, 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 the reference and then they check and maybe they add or tweak things a little bit and put it on the letterhead and sign. So invest in, I would really suggest and encourage people to invest in meeting with your references to just sit them down and explain that, hey, I really want to get a master's scholarship and I really need your help. And this is the kind of help I need from you. Because once you make your request known, they'll be able to manage your expectation of, from them. And that way you'll be able to get the best out of them, which is that you want them to be able to sign your reference letters. So yeah, I would highly encourage that. Exactly. And sometimes 
doing that and explaining the amount of work that is required. Because usually when you're applying for a scholarship, you won't apply for one, you apply for many of them to many schools. And so when you inform your references about your plan, some of them will tell you, hey, I can't do this or I'm not available or X number of months I'll be on leave. And that helps manage expectations on both ends. So yeah, starting with your application, prepare your references. Also start with the bio data. When you go to the portal for the scholarship, enter the bio data first, because you don't want to be on the last day, that's when you're putting your address, you're putting other details. So when you're not doing anything, when you are bored, enter that information beforehand so that on the deadline, you will not be rushing. Then most of the scholarships have essays or personal statements. You need to work on these early. And usually when you're applying for a scholarship, that's what you look out for the, as the first thing so that you can start working on the essays. And once you do them, you need to ensure that you send them to at least two people to proofread. You can give one person who is like your sister or your friend or something like that. That person is just checking for the English and coherence. Whereas you can then give your other essay to another person who has expertise, either they're a scholar themselves or they have a master's or they have kind of experience, someone who you think would be able to edit it for you if it needed editing. So you work on the essays and give at least two people to proofread them. I also want to mention that portals usually crash on the day of the deadline. So you don't want to leave things to the last minute. This sounds very cliche and sounds very um, obvious, but I had one person I was working with on a scholarship last year and they didn't submit because they literally missed the deadline. So after doing all the work, getting all the references, putting all the things together, they didn't meet the deadline because the system became slow and they didn't have enough time to make the submission. So yeah, such things do happen. Common mistakes. Faith, what are some of the common mistakes that people make? Okay, so there are quite a number of common mistakes that people make. Um, and these mistakes, we don't even realize that they are common mistakes, but I've seen it happen quite a number of times and people who've asked me for support on the application have made these mistakes a lot. So I'll just mention a couple here and um, as we get into the question and answer session, I'd really like for your engagement on some of these mistakes and any experiences that you might have had. So number one, this is one of the biggest mistakes people make, self-exclusion. And I think Natasha touched on it a little bit earlier when she was talking about the target population for the scholarship when you're selecting which scholarship to go for. So after you've read the requirements of the scholarship, you just say, ah, me, I can't manage. Me, this, no, I won't be able to do this. I think that is the biggest rubber of opportunities. And Natasha and I always talk about this um, quote. Nat, do you want to share it? <laughs> Yes, self-exclusion is the biggest robber of opportunities. People just exclude themselves because they think they're not worthy or they think they don't have the best grades. I don't have the best grades. <laughs> I know it's usually not something you would share, but I'm just being honest. It's not always about grades. It's not always about being a certain kind of person. It's about putting yourself out there. Sometimes they might even select you because they'll be like, oh, we've never had a Zambian. Let's just put a Zambian here. So sometimes the things that dis determine your success are very different. I recommended a friend to a scholarship for a university in Africa, in Ethiopia, and they got the scholarship and they told them that they were selected because they were the only Zambian that applied and they've never had a Zambian. So that selection was based merely on submitting the application. Of course, I'm not saying we shouldn't work on submissions, but self-exclusion is a robber of opportunity. If you want to remember one thing from this whole webinar, please remember that. Exactly. So common mistake number one, self-exclusion. Number two, choosing the wrong program. Just like I told you earlier, I was applying for scholarships for three years and I was always choosing the wrong program. So in the first year I applied, I was ad given admission to the university, it was University of Michigan, but I couldn't get the scholarship because the scholarship I thought I would be able to get after admission, unfortunately had closed. The second year I was busy buried applying for business related um, programs because I thought, oh, because I have a bachelor's degree in business administration, it's better for me to just focus on this. 
I didn't know that it was difficult for me to justify why I wanted those programs um, to build a case for me to be able to get those scholarships. So when you choose the wrong program, you receive those, we regret to inform you, unfortunately, we received a number of scholarships, you know, that long, long email, which is so disheartening. Um, and that is because you've chosen the wrong program. Another common mistake is missing deadlines and not taking the instructions seriously. I think I really want to emphasize on this point. Once you have done everything you can to put the scholarship application together, missing the deadline is literally just like work done zero and not being on top of things in terms of the instructions. For example, in the instructions, they said you need to have registered for an English exam. Not that you should have your results, but you should have registered. They just want the receipt to show you've registered, but you, you read it as you have to have. So you say, ah, no, I think I'll apply the next cycle after I've had. You've not taken the instructions seriously. Or maybe they've asked you to submit certified documentation, which is a very common thing. They'll ask you to submit certificate, certified documentation, your certified degree. And you, you say, ah, even the transcript, I can just download from the portal and send to them. No, that's not how it works. You have to have your degree certificate and your grades certified. You go to commission of also a police for a, a place and somewhere where you can have documents certified. So this one, I wouldn't necessarily call it a common mistake, but I would call it a, uh, um, uh, something to be cautious of. Hello, can you hear me? It says my internet is unstable. Yes, can we can hear you, Faith. Okay, great. So this one, I have a few friends who I was on the same scholarship with who they said this was, that was the only scholarship they've ever applied for in their whole life. And you're like, wow, there I was with the, I don't know how many applications I had submitted <laughs> prior to getting the MasterCard Foundation scholar, Scholarship. And they had only, only applied for that particular one. So one thing I would say about this is making few applications reduces your chances of getting selected, but making more applications increases your chance. It's pretty much like investment. The higher the investment, the higher the returns. So the more applications, the more good applications or good quality applications you submit, the higher the chances you have in securing a positive response. Another common mistake is incomplete documentation. So pretty similar to not following instructions, you find that they've asked you for CV, um, they've asked you for reference, two references. And in the references, they've said one academic and one professional. But you, you decide that, no, it's OK. It's better I have two references. I'm going to just get to one of my former lecturer, the other one of the dean of school, just because they are two. That is incomplete documentation. Um, in some, some instances, you don't even upload your CV or you don't even finish the essay questions or the essay question says maximum 500 words and you maybe you only write to one, one sentence. You are less likely to be considered because that is an incomplete application. So please be wary of, of some of these things. The other common mistake is not willing to invest in some cost scholarship costs. This one is a big one because there are so many, there are certain costs, hidden costs that come with scholarship applications. Certain scholarships require you to actually have to pay some kind of registration fee or application fee. And you need to, once you read the instructions carefully, you'll be able to understand which one requires amounts and which one doesn't and how much it is. And mostly because these scholarships would not be in Zambian culture, you need to make the conversions. I once applied, so in the years of serious applications, I once applied for a scholarship, um, the DAAD scholarship, and the amount I paid <laughs> was not equivalent to the amount that they had required. So I overpaid for that scholarship application. So to avoid mistakes like that, please read the instructions carefully. The other one is choosing wrong references. Um, this one's quite because we really, I, from one, one thing I've really picked up from this whole process is your reference speaks for you. They have heard everything you've had to say in your application, but your reference is also telling them, oh, 
Faith is also this, this, this. Or this person is also this, this, this. Elena is actually good in this and this and this. So pick referees who know you, who know things about you that would win you a scholarship. Um, my reference for the MasterCard scholarship wrote an excellent, I've never seen such an excellent reference before. And I'm not saying this because um, you have to say this about references, but really she brought out things which I didn't even know about myself. And those are the kind of people you need. So this is the time to create those relationships with people who can speak for you, even when you're not in the room on paper in this case. And lastly, don't give up. <laughs> I know those rejection emails can be daunting and they can make you feel like, oh, wow, I'm not deserving of this and all of that. But if you've started, if you're on this call and you've already started applying and you've maybe received one or two rejections, I would really encourage you to not give up after the first attempt. Um, it's a process. Some people get it quicker than others. Some people, it takes a bit of time, but I would strongly encourage you to keep trying. And the more you try, the better you become at it. So don't give up, believe in yourself. And really for you to put an application out there, it shows that you have confidence in your credibility and you have confidence in the person that you are, that you want to be awarded this um, scholarship. So yeah, those are just some of the common mistakes. Natasha, anything to add? Thanks, Faith. I wanted to talk about the investment. One way to reduce your costs of applying is you could choose those scholarships where you don't pay anything. That also has brought some people problems because I see these links passing on Facebook. The moment you start pass, you start applying for scholarships, you start seeing these fake scholarship links on Facebook. There are usually no scholarships where they tell you to pay to the scholarship. Usually the costs come from paying the fees. So always avoid these generic links saying scholarships, scholarships. Usually you want to look for actual names of scholarships and then you go to those websites as opposed to the miscellaneous websites you get that are written scholarships. You might want to avoid those, but how to reduce your cost is to, to apply to as few schools with a fee as possible. For example, if you're applying for UK scholarships, some universities have fees, while most of them don't. So you can apply to the universities that have no fees instead. That will, will help reduce some of your costs. You could also save towards some of the costs. For example, the English exams are valid for two years. Some are valid for three years. So once you pay for the exam now, you won't have to pay even next year if you have to apply. Another way to help you with the cost is if you've been admitted to a university and you've been selected this year, but you don't have a scholarship, you can write to the university to defer your offer so that when you apply the second time, you won't have to apply to that school again because you already have an acceptance, even for the following academic year. So to help you save on time, that could also um, be very helpful. I guess we can pause here for questions. I've seen some questions in the chat box. Um, Faith, how do you suggest we go about the questions? It would be great to see people's faces and just hear them ask the questions directly. Yeah, if that's possible, if, if you have a question, just feel free to turn on your mic and video if possible and ask your question. <laughs> Okay, Zumani says he's shy. So I guess we can just go ahead and uh, read the questions in the chat box. So Zumani asks, um, how salient are references, supporting essays and resumes? Basically the documentation I think um, we referred to. And another follow-up question, could you share more about the possibility of work study options if one fails to get the scholarship? Okay, this is an interesting one. Okay, and let me scroll if you can see if there are any other questions. Um, Karijatu has a question. Okay, so before we take on, Natasha, do you want to just quickly answer the importance of references, supporting essays and resumes, as well as the work study options? And then right after that, um, Karijatu, you can come in with your question. Thanks, Faith. So for, for scholarships, your essays is the biggest thing that they look at. And that's why things like grades come second. Usually your essays are everything because your essays show them why investing in you is important. 
you want to work on those and make sure that they're perfect. Your resume needs to be relevant to the course that you're studying. So if you're writing, if you have a CV, you need to create one just for scholarships, which shows how your work experience is related to the courses you want to study. Remember earlier, I've seen someone type something that we didn't say, Mutinda. <laughs> we said, think in terms of the field, not in terms of the course and not the other way around. So you need to think in terms of the field. For example, I have a medical degree and I thought in terms of, okay, I want to do something related to public health. So when I'm making a CV, it's going to be something which is showing that I have health experience. And this is less common for people like me who studied medicine, but more common for someone who they studied maybe adult education in their bachelors and they've been working at an institution like Copa Rose which is health related and they want to do a master of public health. So those kinds of people really need to show how their current work experience is related to public health. That's why they should do public health. So you need to think in terms of the field because public health is wide. There's epidemiology, there's health promotion, there's different kinds of courses. So when you think of it as a field broadly, you'll find that maybe in one place it's called health promotion. At one university it's called health promotion. At another university it's called health communication. So when you think of it in terms of the field, you won't be restricted when you find that at one university it's called global health policy, whereas at another university it's called health systems strengthening. That's what I mean when we say the field, but I'm just to answer, I hope I've answered Zumani's question. Your references are very important, but it's first, then your qualifications, then your references, because your references speak to those two to say, okay, this person can do this and this person can't. I have seen a lot of people talking about that British um, requirement to say some universities have been downgraded. Um, Karijatu's question was about that saying that some universities are equated to a diploma. Skip those universities. There are a lot of other universities that are still accepting Zambian students. So move on from those universities and find the ones that still consider the Zambian qualification to be equivalent to a de British degree. And you will still find that there are some, even at the time when, when I was applying and when people before me were applying, those things have come up. But what I would advise is that you just look for schools that are still considering Zambian degrees um, to be sufficient. Yeah. If you have any questions, you can raise your hand. You can use the raising hand option and we'll be able to um, point at you to ask the question directly. Yeah, Karijato, please come in with your question. Feel free to unmute your mic. Okay. Uh, thanks, Faith. Um, so this is right off of what Natasha has just expressed. So then I'd like to know, right, um, how do I get to know my odds with certain universities with regards to if my qualification might be relevant to them. Could I look at metrics or things like how many Zambians have been to this university um, as a form of knowing if I would have good odds of getting in? Because I have gotten offers from certain universities who would tell me like, you have a good portfolio, we just don't recognize your qualification. So how exactly do I go about that? Or are there certain sites where I would know that certain universities in this part of the continent actually recognize Zambian qualifications. Okay, um, so for that, what I know off the top of my head right now is for example, Chivening is, accepts lots of students and you can use the Chivening course find option. There's a portal that says find a course. That one allows you to see which universities are offering the course or the field that you're interested in. One of the best ways to do that is to just go specifically to the schools. But if you use the Chiven and find a course link, it will show you, for example, if you want to do a master's in public policy, you will go to that option and see it. So you type public policy and once you go to those universities, you will then be able to apply. Um, I, I hope this is helpful, but I just want to tell you that that's not true. Using a matrix gives you a generalized response or a general, generalized um, opinion of what the Zambian degree is like, but different schools are still accepting. I just attended a send-off event for some scholars last week or the week before last, 
And there are a lot of Zambians that are still studying abroad for their masters. So I would suggest that you go to this. So each school has got a requirement section. Under the requirements, you can narrow it down to the country. Then it will show you which, which schools are there and which schools are accepting um, students. Another option is some universities in the US as well. Um, there are different universities. I just know someone who went to University of Nebraska and they just graduated and they don't even have work experience. So there are quite a number of universities. You don't look at it in terms of generalizing, but use individual university standards to guide you on how to go about it. Thanks, Nat. Um, just before I, I, I invite that came directly ties with I think one one of the comments that we've made and also a comment that I've seen in the chat box as well so in terms of scholarships they you know when we're talking about deciding which region in that process as you assess which scholarship works you also need to look at what is this scholarship looking for you know, what are the requirements of this scholarship versus what I have? There are certain scholarships, and I think we mentioned it even under the target population, there are certain scholarships that are targeted um, and award candidates based on their academic excellence. And there are certain scholarships that are targeted for, you know, showing leadership, you know, showing leadership in the community or showing some kind of innovation. Maybe you are an entrepreneur, you have a startup company, and this company has brought in this amount of money. So, you know, they should invest in you studying at Harvard because once you get that scholarship, you will be able to, you know, build more millions of young people just like you to start those companies. And I know I have a, I've seen a couple of people who have that kind of profile. I've seen you, uh, and I know you know yourselves. So the way you should think about scholarships is not to say I want to apply because I got a silent or I got a credit or because I got a merit I can get any scholarship. No, you need to compare and contrast which scholarship work best for which people. I don't necessarily subscribe to the assumption that it's based on grades solely because I think scholarships are encompassing of so many other factors. Natasha was just saying earlier that there's somebody who she supported to apply for a scholarship and this person was, was awarded the scholarship because one, they had a complete good quality scholarship, but two, because they were the only Zambian and they were the only, they were the only I think only woman as well on the scholarship. And those things count, those things are big cards. So think about it in that way. Even being under 30 is a privilege. And there was a question earlier about whether there's a minimum qualification. Really, the minimum qualification is that you should have a bachelor's degree. So whatever age you are, as long as you have a bachelor's degree, some would be specific and say highly encourage under 30s, but some will be silent about that. But as long as you have a bachelor's degree, then you'll be able to qualify. Uh, so, uh, in addition, Faith, there is some with a minimum requirement of work experience. For work experience, usually you just want to, you can add up all the work you've ever done, volunteer opportunities, all the things that you do, extracurricular activities, those ones count as work experience as well. So it's just about documenting them the right way. Yeah, I can see some hands. Yes, so let's start with Faith, Kangasa, and then we get to Mumbi. Please raise your hands if you have any more questions. Okay, hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so for my, in my situation, I've been trying to get a master's. I'm trying to balance the work school thing and it's been going pretty badly, but I'm in my second stage. And if I did pass, I'd be in my third stage next year. And given the timelines of how the application processes go, I'm conflicted whether I should acknowledge that I'm studying my master's or I shouldn't when applying for a scholarship. Does that disadvantage me or does it, or could that actually help me? And then okay. um, I did Great. have one friend who got, I think she she mentioned it during an interview, um, during like the scholarship interview and then she got disqualified because she said she had, she had a master's already. So um, based on 
some of the scholarships you guys have managed to get, do you think that's an advantage or any disadvantage? But also bearing in mind the our qualifications in this country, like sometimes they're not considered until you get a master's. Apparently, certain universities in the UK would not would want you to have a master's to actually apply for another master's. Great. Great questions, Faith. Um, we'll just take note of those two and we'll answer them cumulatively. Mumbi, do you want to go ahead with your question? Yes, I can go ahead. So I have two questions. The first one is, this will sound a bit silly, but I sometimes get, I've, for the past 10 years, I've been discouraged to apply because I feel like you're at advantage when you're in the STEM you know, science field, or perhaps if you've got like business background, I come from the arts, I studied librarianship. So I wonder if there would be places that would be able to see what I've done. And my work experience has been in like academia, I've worked in universities, and I've also worked like in the NGO arena. So I wonder like, does that put me at a disadvantage? Because, you know, I've heard what you said when you said it's not just all about grades. I got a second upper for my GPA when I finish my degree? That's one question. And then the second, so the specific thing is like, is it the field that you've done for undergrad that advantages or disadvantages, disadvantages? Well, yes, you. The second one is, you mentioned something about there being schools that have scholarships within. How do you get to that stage? Is there a way of knowing beforehand or do you have to maybe contact the faculty and interact with them and speak about like what you have in mind in terms of research topics is it might be a bit of a lengthy process and I have a, a colleague who told me recently that in certain colleges in the U.S. or universities it's possible to do like a five-year program you start with your master's and then end up doing your PhD in the long run if you are able it's like a fully a full scholarship but it kind of takes a while to get to that stage so you have to kind of get a lot of research done but it is possible so i'd like to hear your thoughts on those two thanks uh, faith should we take on two more and answer all of them as a whole yes i think so so moaneno and then kabongo Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Faith and Natasha, for the very insightful session. So uh, my question is, I've uh, been reading our requirements, uh, of course, not so many, but then I see most of them, you have to, you have to be like uh, physically there. And then, uh, so in that, so in uh, actual sense, you have to like, for those work, stop working. So are there any uh, scholarships maybe that would uh, cover someone like me, maybe who may not be ready to stop working and uh, go there? in person, maybe it could be online or even blended or, or those options. Uh, if, there, if they are, please mention which ones will be available for someone like me. Great question. Kabungo, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Faith and Natasha for this. It's very, very, very helpful. Um, my question really in particular is, very specific and mostly because I, I know that um, uh, Dr. Kaoma attended the Shevnin, um was offered the Shevnin scholarship and she traveled and that's what I'm working to apply. The deadline is the, the 2nd of November, that's when they close. Um, so um, I just wanted a bit more insight on, on or maybe just what specifically about the Shevnin scholarship would she say is particularly something that is um, maybe specific to, to shave mean that you shouldn't miss out on or you should be very attentive to or something that would just make you stand out and get a shave mean scholarship. Yeah, that's all I want to Thank you. If you can start with whichever questions from the many that have been asked, then I'll take up the rest. Okay, sure. Um, so I'll start with, I think I can take on Faith's question. You asked a two-fold question. One about 
if you've started a master's program, should you declare that you've started a master's program? Um, will that advantage you or disadvantage you? And the other one about certain universities, especially in the UK, only taking um, certain, not taking certain qualifications, especially Zambian qualifications, or not giving them this, the type of um, value which we do give them here in Zambia. So in terms of declaring, I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I'll give you an example. There's somebody I know who was awarded a scholarship. This kind of scholarship that she got was a leadership, women encouraging women, encouraging women to apply and get on the scholarship type and not a merit-based scholarship. So because of that, because that's the nature of the scholarship she applied for, she it was already it, it was already given that you should not have had been part of a master's program. And secondly, the scholarship is on a financial needs basis. So they are giving you this scholarship because you tell them, I can't afford to pay. I want to go to Oxford, I want to go to Harvard, but I cannot afford to pay those fees. If you apply for a scholarship like that and you're telling them, me as faith, I can't manage to pay those fees, then I wouldn't encourage you to declare that you have a master's degree. But this is case by case because maybe the qualification is that you should have some experience and have a master's degree. That's when you then can declare and say, I have this um, qualification. So I think the answer to this question is study the requirements of the scholarship. Understand what, who is this scholarship for? What is it that this scholarship body is trying to achieve? One of the things that the MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program tries to achieve is they are trying to make Africa work. So they're trying to empower young people for them to be able to make Africa work. That's in their words. I, I'm not saying I agree, I don't agree, but in this case, it's just to say that they're trying to train young Africans to be able to build or grow Africa. And one of the ways to do this is to provide them scholarships. So if you understand that for them, they are need, they, they're trying to fill in that financial gap, which most Africans don't have access to, to be able to learn at a Russell Group University or an Ivy League University, they come in and they say they'll pay for you. It would be, it would be difficult for them to consider somebody who has shown that they've had the financial means to pay for a master's program. So yeah, that's what I would say about that. And in terms of the qualifications for certain universities, to be honest, I have met people who've said their qualifications have not been recognized, but there are also certain universities that still do recognize um, Zambian qualifications. And I think it would just be a matter of maybe digging deeper. Um, sometimes, I'll, I mean, I would even recommend if you see certain people in the faculty are trying to apply for, you try to drop them an email to say, hi, these are my qualifications. This is what I want to study. And this is my CV just to you know, shoot your shot. Um, and shooting your shot for applications is actually a good thing. I don't think it's something that people should shy away from because you never know. Sometimes people are looking for, you are the person that people are looking for, for the program. So yeah, that's what I would say. Um, Natasha. Okay, someone asked, someone, I think it was Mumbi who studied library studies and they're asking how hard it is. Well, different scholarships have different priorities, but regardless of what scholarship you're looking for, you need to show that investing in you is important. So if you want to do gender studies or library studies, why is it important for you to do it? It's important because we don't have libraries in Zambia. We do have them, but they're not functional. So you want to come back and set up something that's going to work. That's a very good reason for someone to fund that scholarship. So when you're applying for the scholarship, you need to think about how to justify the value, regardless of what program you want to study. There are, for example, Commonwealth has five main thematic areas, which is health and a couple of others. I'm not sure what they are. So whatever course you decide to do, it needs to build into those thematic areas. One other way of looking at it, sometimes people fail to get master's scholarships because they want to stick very closely to what their undergrad degree is. That shouldn't be it. You can even get a, a master's in project management, in leadership, in something different, because whatever sector you're in, we need leaders. So there are project management masters. There are leadership-based masters. There are masters on things like public policy, which are very generic, 
which you can relate to what you've already been doing. Sometimes we find it hard to find programs because we want the exact same degree. I was helping someone with a program last time and they were like, no, since I studied education, I want to do an education master's so that because it's relevant, it's great, but you could also do something else. Um, which is adding on to the skills you already have. So in terms of the person that asked about this course, it doesn't always have to be in the undergrad program you did. You can always justify doing something similar or something broad or generic, which you can bring back into your sector because those skills will be applicable either way. Someone also asked about how to know that the school has scholarships. So when you go to a portal, let's say you go to University of Leeds, under each program, there's going to be a section called fees and funding. Click there. When you click there, it's going to show you what funding opportunities are available. That's how you know whether that program has another thing because my courses are also supported by Commonwealth. So that's how you know that you can apply to that school and that school will have the scholarships. But there are also some scholarships which are not put on the portal. But the easiest way to know is to click fees and funding on the portal for whatever course you've chosen. In the US, they have a different system for PhDs. In Zambia or in the UK, you have to get a master's first then a PhD. But in the US, they have a joint program which starts with a master's in the first two years and ends in a PhD. So you enroll as a PhD student. And that's one way I've seen a lot of people start PhD programs. So after two years, you graduate with an MPhil or some kind of master's and you'll continue on into the PhD program because most PhD students are also lecturing and teaching assistants. The way to do this is you just go to the school and apply. Sometimes you might want to email the faculty but I've noticed a lot of Zambians, we don't like reading the website. Yes, you are looking, I always say, don't search for scholarships on your phone. There are a lot of things you won't see on the website on your phone. Well, they are there, but the button will be so small, you won't click on it. So it's important for you to go to the website. Please use a laptop. I think you'll see more uh, and you'll be able to see what programs are there and who you can approach. But for most of these, once you accept the, once you receive an acceptance, then they'll start emailing you stuff about starting school, about scholarships, and that's how you get some of them. So some of them won't be on the website. They'll only be sent to those that have received an acceptance letter. Yeah. In terms of distance and blended learning, I once asked someone about this, and their explanation to me made me understand why I didn't want a distance scholarship. So they explained to me that, for example, the Commonwealth has 700 spots for master's scholarships, but only 50 spots for distance scholarships. That's globally, meaning that by virtue of applying for a distance program, what people are looking out for is why do you have to stay in your country for you to do the program? Why don't you want to go? So you have to justify why you have to stay. For example, this works very well for people who are in leadership positions at work because they justify to say, I'm leading this department and I want these skills to learn how best to manage my department so I can't go or I can't do anything. So most of the distance learning scholarships are given to people with high positions because they can justify why they can't travel. Another way to deal with this, I initially thought about this, about doing a distance scholarship as well, but the other challenge is that with distance scholarships, sometimes you don't benefit as much from the networking opportunities that come with being, um, for example, meeting your classmates or meeting other people and other benefits that come with the scholarship. But definitely there are some that are available. I know Harriet Watt has got a distance MBA. Africa Leadership University also has a distance program as well as University of Edinburgh. They have a global distance scholarship program. So there are a few, but they are very restricted in terms of what courses. And most of them are usually for people who are considered to be in leadership positions. It's not impossible, but it's um, much more difficult for a distance program. One way to deal with this sometimes is also to just do a shorter master's. For example, the UK and Netherlands, their master's is one year, whereas Sweden and many other countries, including the US, the master's is two years. So being away for a year is easier than being away for two years. So that's another way to help you choose that. And the last question was about the Chevening application. 
The chevening application is about leadership. You have to show that you are a leader. And most people struggle with writing I when they're writing application. So when you want to show you're a leader, you need to show what you as a person did. So if you're leading a team and your team met its financial target and you want to write that in your essay, you need to show what you did as an individual. What contribution did you make that enabled the team to get that outcome? So a lot of people don't get the scholarship or don't get scholarships or because of how they write. They put things like we, they're not giving the scholarship to your whole company. They're giving the scholarship to you as a person. So you need to write of yourself as an individual. What did you actually do? And how have you demonstrated leadership? So with achievement, it's about demonstrating leadership. If you are ahead of a certain department, how have you demonstrated leadership? How have you contributed to your community as well? So whatever leadership skills you are building, marry that with the community aspect and you'll be able to do that. But there are a lot of other shivening opportunities and shivening platforms you can check on YouTube. The British Council also has host events, including the British High Commission. Um, please do check them out. They do host a lot more directly shivening based applications. There are even WhatsApp groups, not what, yeah, WhatsApp groups and Facebook groups for shivening applicants, which you can get information from. But generally it's about showing your leadership, yeah. Great, thanks, Natasha. Exactly. Since we're already so here on the has, the question. Oops, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, Please since we're on the topic of shivening, there's a question in the chat box about the question that comes in the application regarding what benefit you will bring after you get the scholarship to your country. Can you speak a little bit about that? Well, there are so many benefits. Well, I, I have prepared people for shivening scholarships, which is interview preps um, and things like that. And one thing I've seen is that you need to show how it will benefit your country based on whatever program you've decided. Sometimes people don't have a, okay, it comes from your five to 10 year goal. What is your five to 10 year goal as an individual? I know you, some people just want a scholarship so they can leave the country and never come back. Those are the kinds of people that they don't want. So that's what they're trying to gauge from that question. <laughs> Faith, I can see you smiling. But yeah, that question is meant to get all the people who just don't want to come back to admit it. Um, either that or even in the interview, when they ask you that question, they just don't want you to be that person who wants to leave and is using a scholarship as an, a way to leave the country. In terms of how it will benefit the country, there are many ways of, of, of looking at it. It's difficult to answer because I don't know what program you are looking at. And I might give an example that may not be applicable, but generally speaking, you want to show that when you go out there, what you're coming back to achieve is in line with your five year goal. I worked with someone who was running a, a sports club and they got the scholarship and went to study exercise medicine. And they said that when they came back, they wanted to build an exercise um, medicine or a rehabilitation school because we don't have one like that in Zambia. So you need to show that you're going to learn something there that you're bringing back to this country that we don't have or is underdeveloped. Some people, for example, want to go out there and study something like inform health informatics or data science. You have to show that we don't have enough data scientists in Zambia. UNSA doesn't offer that program. So you want to go there and learn so that you can come back and participate in data management. You want to also lecture at the university to pass on the skill. You have been in this organization that reaches out to a million people a year. So once you come back with that knowledge, it's going to trickle down to those million people that you reach every day. If you work for a bank, you can say that your bank has 50,000 clients. So when you come back with those skills, it could trickle down to that and eventually um, the banking sector will improve. Things like that. Um, I hope I've answered your question, but generally speaking, those are some of the things that you would say to talk about developing your country. Uh, Nat, just a quick addition to that. Um, thanks for mentioning that and thanks for the question. I think another way to tie back your reason for applying and why you've chosen the program is to think about what are the gaps in the economy in Zambia or in the sector that you are, the field that you're studying. So if there are 
I mean, there are so many problems out there. If you really sit down and think, oh, there are so many challenges that we, we face, skills gap, all those sorts of things. Think about how once you get the knowledge from the program, and it all comes down to understanding the course content. Think about when you get the knowledge from the program, that knowledge from this course, you can even cite some courses, this course and this course and this course, they are going to help me be able to build people's capacity when I come back to Zambia to be able to deal with this big problem we have. Maybe it's data protection, or maybe it's, um, it can be anything really, it can be management of big funding or anything like that. So you can find ways in which you tie the problems that are already happening on the ground now in Zambia to the program that you are intending to study and how them paying for your study is beneficial, not only for you, but for the people who come back and learn from the skills you have, you've gained. So think about it in that lens and that will be able to help you answer that question. Okay, uh, we are coming to the end of the session. Um, this has been a very interesting discussion and I'm just going to go around for, anyone to ask any last round of questions. Anything you would like to know? Um, there was a question that came to me about the slides. Sure, we will be sending you these slides. Um, I think the, e yeah, your emails have been shared and um, we'll use those emails to share the slides with you and potentially share even the links to some of those scholarships that we mentioned so that you can have something to refer to as well as you know click and have access to. Any final thoughts, final questions? Uh, there's a hand from Kabongo. Yes, please go ahead. Um, thanks. I just wanted to ask about the scholarship that you uh, were awarded. What's it called again? Sorry. Me or not? <laughs> you. <laughs> okay. Um, so I received the MasterCard Foundation Scholarship um, at the University of Edinburgh. And my master's degree was in Africa and international development. Okay, okay. I just wanted to, to ask you more a bit about that, like what, what do they look for um, and also when, when are they open for applications? Okay, so sadly, this scholarship is the last cohort. Um, the cohort after mine was the last one to be recruited. Um, the scholarship, the funding to the university has come to an end through the MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program. But the MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program does have other universities which offer both the program I studied and also other programs that would be that might be of interest to you. So one thing I'll propose is to just look up the MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program. You can just do a quick Google search, but then in the slides we'll share, we'll be able to hyperlink all of these scholarships we've mentioned to you so that you can have um, all of that access in one slide, in one document. Okay, Emma, please go ahead. Okay, for me, not a question, just a commendation. This was really insightful. Thank you for sharing the knowledge. Um, for me, I think something I suffered with, or I, I can point at, I suffered a lot with uh, the self-exclusion of saying, oh, I'm not a, you know, like, it's so hard to, 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 <laughs> to consider yourself a leader. You know what I mean? But I, 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 I like what you guys said. Like, there's so many roles even in your life, maybe even your church group or whatever, where you can show that, oh, I do have some leadership qualities. So it's been very insightful and it's an encouragement to me to put myself out there. So thank you guys. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, it's so good to hear that. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest things is we always think, we always downplay our achievements. And yesterday I was on a webinar, I was telling Nat that the person on the webinar was saying, sometimes we're always so stuck in trying to figure out what's the next big move, but we don't take time to reflect on even the last decade, even the last year, what have you been able to do? You being selected as Secretary General of the Youth department at church or you being able to even just in your role at work um, and maybe if you're not in employment just you being able to take the initiative to even look for employment I feel like we downplay some of these efforts that we make so when you're looking for a scholarship always remember to 
write those small things like, oh, I realized this about myself and I did this and this is how this is going to benefit me for me to be able to be awarded this scholarship. And yeah, just believe in yourself because you're putting all the confidence you have in yourself on paper for someone else to read. So it starts from within. Great. Nat, any final thoughts before we come to a close? Secretariat, Chewe, Michelle, anything to say? Yes. Hi, hi, everyone. Yeah, so I'll be sending a link for evaluation in the chat. So just for better programming, just make sure before you leave the call, just make sure you fill in the form that I'm just sending now. Thank you. Great, thanks, Chewe. Well, from me, I'd just like to say thanks to everyone who joined. There are so many opportunities out there in the world. There are so many, but oftentimes we think that they are for other people. So I just want to encourage you guys to go for it. And if you don't get it the first time, please try again. Faith has explained how it happened with her and um, so many other people as well. In fact, most people don't get a scholarship on first attempt. So if you don't get it on first attempt, that shouldn't discourage you, but also reach out to people. And like I said, when you're reaching out, reach out with an exact question, not just, hi, I need your help. At what point and what kind of help are you looking for? People will be more receptive um, to those um, that way, but also use Google, use YouTube, Almost everyone that's gotten a scholarship has posted about it on YouTube or online somehow. So there are lots of places you can reach out to for inspiration. Otherwise, I have a great Sunday and have a productive week. Great, thanks everyone. And please follow our social media pages to have access to more of these sessions that um, Chewe and team run at the Hub. Would really appreciate your support. Um, and please like and follow all of our socials. Thank you. And for people who would like to share this, we'll share it on our YouTube, the video of this session, we'll share it on our YouTube page as well so that you can be able to have access to it. Have a lovely rest of your afternoon. Cheers, bye.